Hello, everyone. Welcome to Third Thursdays with Tom and Tim. I'm Tim Nutt. I'm Tom Dillard, and we're glad to have you with us tonight. Our show is really an opportunity. It, 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 the purpose of our show is really it gives us an opportunity to talk about uh, Arkansas history and Arkansas culture in a broad sort of way, reach a lot of people uh, through a uh, remote access means. And so uh, we've now had about six of these or so. And um, tonight we're going to be talking about baseball history and baseball culture. Uh, Neither one of us are particularly knowledgeable about this <laughs> subject. Uh, maybe one of us a little more knowledgeable than the other, but not likely. That's why we have expert guests on our show. That is true. Um, well, that kind of reminds me that um, that uh, the reason we came up with uh, this, uh, the theme for this show is I was going through some of my old papers from elementary school. And uh, I came across an essay that I wrote uh, when I was in the fifth grade about my first baseball experience when I was seven years old. And uh, why don't you share that experience with us? Well, it kind of proves how naive I was uh, in elementary school. I know that probably comes as a shock to a lot of people, but I was <laughs> naive. Where, where were you in elementary school? Uh, Bigelow Elementary School in Perry County. Yes, Bigelow, where they rip up the yearbooks because of a timeline. But go ahead. <laughs> so, um, so I remember in the in this essay, I talk about how there were uh, people, uh, my classmates, uh, having a baseball game, and I decided that one day that I wanted to play baseball. And I don't know why I hadn't played baseball before then, but uh, so I went up and I asked if I could uh, join the game. And they said I could. And so uh, I was put on, on one of the teams and it was my turn, my turn to come up to bat and I came up to the plate. And, um, and so they were getting, the pitcher was getting ready to throw the ball. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have a, qu a few questions before we start. <laughs> and, um, and so they said, well, what are your questions? And I said, well, my first question is, can I let the, ba the ball bounce and then hit it? <laughs> And I remember in, in this essay, I, I'll talk about how they laughed and said that was funny and that, no, I couldn't do that. And then I asked whether I, um, once I hit the ball, if I could just run the entire bases or if I had to stop at each individual base. <laughs> and so um, they schooled me on the, uh, on the rules and regulations of baseball. And so- um, Well, since you've been schooled, let me ask you some questions. Okay. Um, the first baseball game in Arkansas was played in 1867 between two teams I'd really never come across in anything I'd read about. The, uh, the Pulaski Baseball Club and... What was the name? The Galaxy it? Baseball Club. Galaxy, Baseball, Galaxy Club. Baseball Club. Do we know whether or not a lot of Union soldiers were in that uh, those teams? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. There was there were know. a number of uh, of uh, Union soldiers stationed in Little Rock in 1867, and um, I suspect that that might have played a role in the introduction of baseball. So they were, there were still Union soldiers in Arkansas in 1867 after the Civil War? Yeah, yes, indeed. Um, well, of course, there was a, an arsenal in, in Little Rock, and, but these were people who were here. Uh, who lived here. But many of them stayed here, mm -hmm. yes. But there were also Union soldiers stationed in Little Rock in 1867. And the uh, Reconstruction Acts would be passed shortly. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Dean brothers, Dizzy and Daffy. Yes. Now, I think every even if the even a baseball green person like me would know Daff, Daffy and Dizzy Dean. Okay, what county did they grow up in? I don't think I don't know that. I don't know the answer to that one. Yale County. Uh, 
in the Arkansas River Valley. Uh, I should have known that since Yellow County is right next to Perry County. Jim Yeager points out in his wonderful book, Backroads and Ball Players, which is just a fun, fun read and full of good information. He points out in there that uh, Yale County is in some ways sort of like a seedbed of Arkansas baseball. Tremendous numbers of important players came out of there, including um, the Dean, Dizzy and Daffy Dean. I think that's interesting. I wonder why Yale County has produced so many uh, baseball players. I don't know. Uh, I, that's a good question. And uh, you can ask Jim Yeager, somebody who might actually know the answer to that. <laughs> oh, one last question. There was a, one of the pioneering players for Arkansas was a, a Jewish man who changed his name to Harry Kane, K-A-N-E. What was his real name? I do know this, but the only reason I know this is because... You've been looking at my notes. Well, that, yes, but also uh, that Jim is going to talk about him later, and so he's in our PowerPoint. Oh, so. well, his name was Cohen, Cohen. Mm -hmm. and he was from where? I, I don't remember that. Hamburg, down in Ashley County. Oh, okay. I didn't remember that. Well, you did really well on that quiz. I'm, I'm impressed. For someone who just started playing baseball at age seven, I think I did pretty well. <laughs> well, you started and stopped. <laughs> well, I played seven. baseball throughout school, not regularly, but... You played t-ball in the eighth grade. Hmm. Well, I mean, no one would ever accuse me of being a baseball uh, athlete, baseball player. But, you know... While you and I might not have been particularly eager in our uh, participation in, in baseball, that was not at all typical. Baseball caught on quickly in Arkansas. And before you know it, uh, in the years following the Civil War, every little town in the state came to have its own uh, baseball team. Mm -hmm. And they took it seriously. This is the uh, team uh, fielded by the little town of Walker, a mere crossroads in White County, I would say sometime in the 1890s. That's an estimate, uh, but uh, it, it's pretty early. See the baseball bat. The bats are uh, of that earlier design. The caps have not really emerged into full baseball caps, but I love this picture. It, it just shows you how uh, seriously local folks in Arkansas. Keep in mind that these guys worked probably as farmers uh, and they worked hard uh, throughout the year and yet they took time to to play baseball. It was a you know it was a really a democratic sport uh, allowing people of you know as long as they could afford baseballs and bats they could play. Mm -hmm. Well, I think even though, you know, they could probably make anything into a bat, um, but um, I, I think you're right with it being a democratic sport, you know, everyone could join in, um, and uh, as long as you had the right number of people, you could form your own team. I was really surprised to learn that uh, the first baseball uh, game in, in Arkansas or in Little Rock was 1867. I didn't realize it had been that early, but... But I, I, you're right. I, I bet if if um, I bet every town in Arkansas had a baseball team at least at some point in its history. Yes, I, th I think so. You know, uh, I collect uh, books on Arkansas, and uh, if you if you go through a, a book on a town or a county in Arkansas, you're probably going to find some early baseball pictures or some mm -hmm. recreational pictures which include baseball. Yeah, cotton plant, small town over in uh, East Arkansas. Uh, what county is cotton plant in? Is it Woodruff? I'm going to say Woodruff. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. You know, I, I know the mo most of these counties and towns, but that one I'd forgotten. Uh, you can see here that they are uh, playing in, in unmatched uniforms, like the earlier team from Walker. 
Uh, let's see what our next picture is. The Little Rock Travelers. Well, everyone's familiar with the uh, Arkansas Travelers now, uh, of course. Um, but they started out as the Little Rock Travelers uh, in the late 1890s. Um, um, and then they were renamed the Arkansas Travelers in 1957. But um, I did not know it was that late. I assumed that they had been Arkansas Travelers earlier than that. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember the field uh, they played at. Um, what was that field? Was it Cavanaugh Field that they played at? Do you I remember? I don't remember. Um, but then, of course, the the fame, and you know, of course, they play at Stevens Dickey now, the Travelers do, but they played at Ray Winder for a long time. And a lot of people were sad to see Ray Winder uh, demolished. Generations of Central Arkansas boys and girls, especially later, uh, came to know baseball at Ray Winder Field. And my son um, worked there when he was in high school. Um, it's, um, it has a warm, it brings a warm memory to many Arkansans who followed uh, the Travelers. They still have the scoreboard uh, standing. Uh, you know, of course, it's, a, it's at UAMS now. Uh, well, UAMS uses it as a parking lot now, but the scoreboard is still standing. So that's kind of a nice. Uh, remnant of, of the old Ray Winder. Do you know what the what are the two animals that the travelers have at their mascots? You know, I had no idea that they even had mascots. I mean, I thought the traveler was their mascot. Well, they have a horse. The horse is their one of their mascots, and then a a possum is another one of their mascots. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's a picture of Ray Winder, and at some point in, in the 90s, I remember watching on TV that they used to have all these uh, commercials, and then the, at some point, or at, they would always advertise the, the woman who uh, got in the box, and then the box blew up. Do you remember that? And they would all, always advertise the game as the greatest game on dirt, which was a play off of the uh, uh, greatest show on earth, Barnum and Bailey Circus. Well, there was a lot of... Uh that sort of entertainment aspect uh, to baseball. You know, did you, have you ever been to a Traveler game? One time. One of the things that, that you generally notice when you go to the game is that there's a lot of just um, ancillary activity, ancillary entertainment, uh, the organ music, the uh, interesting activities that seem, that came to be part of it all that uh, manager Bill Valentine brought to it. He was a promotional genius in many ways. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about it, a baseball game, the field is almost like uh, uh, a big top tent. And so you have the pitcher is the, uh, the ringleader. And then you have all these different things going on around the, part, around the ringleader. You know, Bill Valentine, whom I mentioned a minute ago, uh, Bill, I knew Bill back in the early 70s before he went to work for the Arkansas Travelers as manager. And um, he has a very interesting, very interesting history. You know about his, the controversy associated with the, uh, um, uh, the umpire strike and the role that he played in it. Um, but uh, Bill Valentine, the thing, the, the one time I was, I was at a, I was at a, an event. This had nothing to do with baseball, but he was there and he was in charge and there were some of his employees there and he was furious. And that man knew how to throw a fit. So that's one of the strongest images I have in my mind of Bill Valentine, a great guy who really found his, his home in, in the, in, in the Travelers. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, the Travelers now, you know, for the longest time, the Travelers were the only minor league baseball team in Arkansas. And that, that changed in the early 2000s. You remember that? Where we, when we got the Naturals up in Northwest Arkansas? Yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> I had no idea uh, 
what their mascots are. I was surprised to learn from you that they are Sinker the Sea Monster and Strike the Sasquatch. Sasquatch. Now I I was doing research for this show, and I this is I could not find why they chose this. This is my theory, and I hope someone who's listening can can either confirm or, or correct me on this. But of course, there are the naturals, natural state. But Sinker the Sea Monster, I think, is a reference to the White River Monster that is supposedly uh, sort of like the Loch Ness Monster. And then Strike the Sasquatch is like the Falk Monster uh, down in uh, south, uh, southwest Arkansas. The Falk Monster is supposed to be sort of like a Bigfoot. So that's my theory. Well, neither one of those are in the in Northwest Arkansas. Well, so I think probably people like Michael Dugan who are watching this tonight are, and who really know Arkansas baseball and Jim Yeager are probably shaking their heads in wonderment at us. Well, but th if they were going to just stick to Northwest Arkansas, they wouldn't have named themselves the Naturals because the Naturals or Arkansas is the natural state. They could have said Northwest Arkansas uh, retail giants or something. You know, you said that for a long time, we only had one professional team in the state. We had other uh, minor league teams that that were professional to some degree. Many of them did receive some sort of pay, though none of them were paid anything like they should have mm -hmm. been. But one of those teams was also out of Northwest Arkansas, the Fayetteville Angels. Mm -hmm. And I love the story of the Angels. I believe you have a copy of uh, of the, the book on the Angels. Yes, we do. Um, I do. And this is um, Jerry Hogan's book, J.B. Hogan's book, Angels in the Ozarks, which is the history of the Angels. I don't have a slide uh, for the Angels. Uh, uh, that, that's a fine book, and, and if you want to uh, read some really interesting uh, local baseball history, uh, Jerry Hogan's book would be a great stay, place to start. It's fun. Uh, Jerry's a good writer, uh, and he knows his baseball. He knows his baseball from that area particularly. Do you, know, do you remember how the angels got their names they weren't were always known as the angels oh this yes i had forgotten and forgotten about this but um you know these teams just basically survived on a usually on pretty small uh amounts of income mm -hmm. ticket sales usually didn't amount to very much and so they had to beg borrow and steal and the angels were originally the educators, the Fayetteville educators, and then the Bears, and they became the Angels when they accepted some hand-me-down uniforms from Ponca City, Oklahoma, and they put these uniforms on, and it said Angels on the back, embroidered, and they faced a conundrum. I mean, what they decided to do was to just change the name of the team to the Angels. That was a simple approach. Yeah, today. instead of ripping out the Angels on the uniform and having to stitch in the Bears, they just decided now, to change their name. The Claybrook Tigers, which you see here mm -hmm. from over in uh, Crittenden County, uh, uh, Claybrook was a, a small town over there, Crossroads Village. Uh, it was established by John C. Claybrook, uh, a very prominent uh, black uh, businessman, farmer uh, over in East Arkansas. And he, he built a small stadium for them to play in. He provided them with real uniforms and equipment. Um, and... I understand that some of the players uh, for the Claybrook Tigers uh, went on to have uh, important uh, careers in the uh, Negro Baseball League. Mm -hmm. The Negro Leagues, uh, of course, it was they were segregated back then. 
Um, and uh, so this was during the 1930s. And I love the names that uh, baseball players often get. Uh, either because of their, you know, their speed of their pitch or something like that. But uh, one was called, or one was named Fireball Smith from the Claybrook Tigers, John the Brute Lyles, and Ted Double Duty Radcliffe. Do you know why they called him Double Duty? No. They called him Double Duty because he was the manager, but he also played. Uh, so he, he makes sense. He made he did double duty. So um, it's interesting baseball. In, uh, uh, history is pretty interesting. If two guys like us who have no baseball background and now I did play in the third grade. Now, yes, I don't you remember that. With little baseball background. <laughs> but if we can get interested and excited about baseball history, I think what that points to is just the fact that baseball is a really important part of American recreational history. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 just American history in general. Uh the, the separation by race, for example, represents, uh, you know, one of the central themes of American history. Well, I think let's bring on our guest who knows a little bit. Who more actually knows some something. Arkansas baseball yeah. history. So you want to introduce Jim? Jim Yeager. We're glad to have you with us. I mentioned your book earlier. Uh, it's a it's a great work. Uh, Jim, I don't really uh, have a formal introduction for you, but I do want to mention that you're from Russellville. Uh, he's a member of the Society of American uh, Society for American Baseball Research, and there's a local chapter here in Arkansas called the Robinson Kell Arkansas Chapter. And uh, Jim is a frequent presenter on the history of rural baseball in Arkansas. His book, remember, was titled Back Roads and Ball Players. So it's the rural contribution to Arkansas uh, that uh, he really is uh, knowledgeable about. Uh, Jim, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in baseball history and give us some information. Uh, first, uh, do you hear me okay, guys? I appreciate you having me tonight. I, I do. Have a love for the game and love for Arkansas history. And I literally have my baseball hat on tonight, so I feel qualified to speak to you about baseball. <laughs> One thing uh, baseball is given to the world is this is this headgear, you know. You seldom see anybody mowing their lawn in a football hat. So baseball has pretty much gotten that uh, that uh, wardrobe award for for uh, a hat, the cap, lasting be, being part of baseball culture. I was always interested in baseball. I was interested in history and Arkansas history. My grandfather was a teacher in the one room schoolhouses up in the mountains. Um, he had stories about everything. He actually wrote a book about his uh, work in the one room schoolhouses. And I, uh, I kind of caught the history bug from him, maybe the education bug also. And um, always loved playing baseball. In fact, as Tim talked about his third grade experience, I remember my first career choice was to be second baseman for the Yankees. And um, when I was having enough trouble being second baseman for Ozark Town Team, I felt like maybe I was being a little bit ambitious and scaled it down a little bit and decided to become a teacher. And uh, just really fell in love with the game and fell in love with research in college. And uh, retiring after 50 years of education gave me the opportunity to kind of pursue both of those loves, um, baseball, and, which I couldn't play anymore, but I could study and write about and stay out of Susan's way, you know, and, and uh, Find a little niche and something I enjoyed. Um, you are a you have a history degree from UCA, Correct. and you studied under Waddy Moore as I did. Right. Uh, when did you graduate from that program? Well, I graduated under three different names. They kept changing the name of the school, and I kept finding it. You know, Tom, you probably went to state teachers actually. Correct. So no, uh, it was SCA when I was there. That was uh, much younger. I, I'm, I'm the, I went to all three of those schools. I went to Arkansas State Teachers for a semester. They changed the name and I found it the next year. It was called State College of Arkansas when I refound it. And then I stayed there and got uh, an undergraduate degree and a master's degree from the University of Central Arkansas. So it's in the same place. It looks generally the same, but uh, the name was different. And, and I did stud study under Dr. Moore. Never did really like to write too much, but I love the research. Well, that, that seminar at 
at UCA turned out a huge number of interesting papers and a surprising number of those uh, were published in right. journals all across the state. And I think yours was. Yeah, I, I got a call about a month ago, actually an email from a lady who said, uh, I had met her at one of my presentations in Clarksville. I kind of knew the name and, and uh, she said, uh, by the way, are you Jimmy Yeager? And I said, uh, well, maybe. Um, depending on if you're from Ozark or not, I probably am. Or if you're related to me, uh, I'm probably Jimmy Yeager. And she said, we, if you're Jimmy Yeager, we'd like to, to uh, publish your coal mining story in our quarterly bulletin. Well, my coal mining story was written 50 years ago <laughs> when I was an undergraduate at UCA. I kind of panicked a little bit and said, okay, can I see that first to see what the Jimmy Yeager's look, work looked like 50 years ago. I cleaned it up a little bit. I guess they published it. I haven't seen it, but uh, it's it's kind of an interesting thing when somebody says, can we print one of your works? And it turns out to be something you wrote 50 years ago when you were 20 years old. But uh, hmm. I just kind of closed my eyes and hoped. You had a career in, in education, correct? Correct. Teaching and coaching? Yes, and I was guidance counselor for 28 years. And you are now, you've been retired for a while and, and you live in, in Russellville and you have been spending a good deal of time doing baseball research. I, I'm, I was just blown away. I, I, when I started working on the book, it was really a hobby. I, I'd like to say, you know, some idealistic thing about it, wanting to save the stories and wanting to get the game out there for people to understand the culture and our legacy and our heritage. But that wasn't really true. It was just... I was interested in it and I, I did the research. It wasn't until after I wrote the book that I expected to sell about 50 copies and keep 25 of those, that it turned out that uh, uh, the email started pouring in and the invitations started coming. And when I went to my first historical association meeting and 30 people lined up to buy a book and tell me their grandpa story, I then realized that I really tapped into something something really bigger than an old story about an old baseball guy, but there's stories about hard times and, and uh, making it through those tough years with, with baseball and church and music. My buddy Charlie Sandage says it was baseball or a grand old Opry church and music that saved an entire generation of, of our Kansas. And, and I think baseball is really part of that. Well, I think one of the things that that speaks to was that uh, you, you know, people had so few entertainment options for, uh, we didn't get radios in large numbers until at least the thirties, probably closer to the forties. Right. We didn't get television really until the fifties, maybe even in large numbers, even the late fifties or early sixties. So I always think of baseball as a way for people to uh, get out, enjoy some time, kill some time, you know, I, I think the well, you didn't have to go to, school to, to do it. You know, you didn't have to go to school to do it. And a lot of the guys I researched didn't really care about school. So that was a big plus. You didn't have to go to school. Um, another thing I think was it took very little equipment to play. You could devise some sort of game with three guys or five guys or 10 guys. And uh, it, uh, it really, uh, it was a simple game. You throw it, you hit it, you catch it. You didn't even need a glove. And, uh, it, it really caught on among uh, rural people um, who had, you know, a few acres to play on and a little money to, to buy a ball and a bat, and uh, it was an escape. It, it really helped them escape from the reality of their world, from a war and a flood and a drought and a depression and whatever else we were facing in those days. Uh, baseball really helped. Um, and as Charlie said, baseball and the Grand Ole Opry, the St. Louis Cardinals and the Grand Ole Opry. The, the country people love those two things. And Carter's Little Liver Pills. Carter's Little Liver Pills, yes. <laughs> you know, Senator Byrd from West, West Virginia said that, um, that, if it, that West Virginia would never survive without, uh, without the help of God and Carter's Little Liver Pills. <laughs> I'm sure that's correct. <laughs> well, uh, Jim, uh, let's talk about some of the players that you feature in your book. I'm going to share this, my screen again and uh, see if we can, um, so you can talk about um, 
some of the folks uh, that are highlighted in your book. And, uh, and Tom's already mentioned the first one you're going to talk about. Now that's Harry Kane. Um, Harry was, uh, in my book, I identified him as the first uh, Arkansas-born major leaguer in the 20th century. Uh, and I, I began to have my doubts about that. I mean, I, it just didn't fit. Here was a Jewish kid from St. Louis. Was he really the first Arkansan to play major league baseball? It, it just seemed like I was going to punch a hole in that. And so I set out to prove that wasn't true. And the first one, I, first person I contacted was a young man who's kind of the expert on all things in our organization. Uh, the young man um, who lives now in Boston. But uh, I contacted him and he, uh, he said, yeah, I believe he did. He said, I believe, uh, I believe he really was the first Arkansan. So we went to some newspapers. We went to a census. We found out there was a Jewish population in Hamburg and Lake Village, and some of those guys were traveling, traveling merchants with wagons, and and uh, and he, Harry King was was really one of those guys. But he had a backstory similar to the country guys. Uh, he may have come from a retail background, but his his backstory was just as colorful as theirs. Um, when he made the, the the major leagues, he wasn't very good, but he thought it needed a nickname, and that's when he changed his name from Harry Cohen or it may have been K-O-H-N, but C-O-H-E-N, to Harry Kane. He, he, was, he thought that would be a more uh, neutral name, let's say. But then he thought he needed a nickname, and he thought, Harry Kane, they'll understand that that really means hurricane. If, if I, that, that'll be, kind of be my moniker, but they didn't get it. So uh, Kane went back and revised his nickname and came up with the nickname Klondike. So then he called himself Klondike Kane. That, that caught on a little better and made a little better nickname. He hung around baseball for about 30 years and uh, finally became an umpire. And probably as he would have wished, he uh, died of a heart attack on the field. Um, actually survived being carried off the field, but died um, while he was an umpire about 30 years after he broke into the game. Quite a story. Real interesting fella. His name was Harry and not Henry. That, right. yeah, that was Harry. Yeah. Harry yeah. The, the PowerPoint's uh, wrong on that. I'm going to have to talk to the person who did that PowerPoint. Yeah, well, it's close enough. If Harry would have accepted that. He would have gone for Hank Kane, maybe, if that's, that's good. You know, interestingly, uh, when I worked at Fayetteville, I had a discussion with a, a gentleman from Camden, uh, and he, he lived in Camden in the 1920s, early 1930s. He was Jewish, and he talked about uh, his friends uh, – and um, Jewish baseball players in Camden back in the 20s and 30s, which I, it was it was very interesting. Um, There's a new museum of Jewish baseball online. You can find that. Um, and uh, one of the commissioners, Ford Frick, has done a lot of research about it and, and uh, still discovering uh, Jewish baseball players who played under assumed names back in the early part of the 20th century. One of the the shadows that we have over the game, uh, like the Negro Leagues. Uh, my friend Roy Dudley, who runs an antique uh, sales, he has a postcard, or he had a postcard from New York, and it was a picture of a baseball team, and they were called the House of David baseball team, hmm. um, which was... They became a, a barnstorming team, and um, they first represented the church, but they weren't very good, and so they, they couldn't compete with just church members. So they started letting people play for the House of David who just look like they belong to the church. Wow. So they, they look something like Tom looks now with, with, the, with a dark beard. <laughs> and so if you could grow the beard, you could be on the House of David baseball team if you were Catholic or Presbyterian. It didn't make any difference. Ah, okay. As long as you could play a little ball and you look like the House of David. And, and they became like the globetrotters of, of baseball barnstorming. Oh, interesting. Well, the next person, Charles Boss Schmidt, is an interesting character. And he is an interesting character, as most of these guys are, because they uh, they came without uh, without much education and and uh, not very uh, adept at using time or money. Had never had any of either. And Boss was a coal miner back in the coal mining days of of the early Russellville and Johnson County mines. And he was one of those guys who would do just about anything to escape the coal mines. So baseball turned out to be his escape. And um, he was actually not a very good baseball player. 
but no one dared to tell him that because he was definitely the toughest guy in pro sports. You know, these days, uh, the football players have the reputation for being the tough guys, you know, like Ray Nitsky or, or J.J. Watt or some of those guys. But Boss Smith was the toughest guy in the pro game. And since no one saw pro games on television and they did know about baseball, they could pick up the paper and see that Boss had beat up somebody or especially Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb was a great player, but not very well liked. And Boss seemed to make it his personal challenge to beat up Cobb occasionally because that seemed to get him some prestige among the other players. He also drove nails with his fist. He would stand up against the wall and let someone throw a ball at him for 10 bucks. Uh, just about anything you could think of to make a buck, and uh, as long as it didn't require much skill. But so he was the first real star of, of Major League Baseball from Arkansas. Uh, he died penniless in Johnson County, was buried up on St. Mary's Mountain with uh, no stone. The Tigers found out and supplied him with a headstone. And, and now in, at, at the cemetery on St. Mary's Mountain, you can see Boss Smith's grave. And uh, uh, I know you've got the picture there of the sports bar. Mm -hmm. um, if I have a minute, I'll talk about the sports bar. Um, uh, Boss was the maybe the entrepreneur who, who first came up with the idea of a celebrity sports bar. And that is on Garrison Avenue in Fort Smith, or was, but not anymore. But uh, Boss spent the off season uh, at the Smith Nugent Sports Bar on Garrison Avenue. And so he gets credit for developing the idea of a celebrity sports bar. You could drop by sometime. And usually if you bought him a beer, you could catch uh, Boss there. Uh, he made appearances there every, every winter evening probably, and was really a character, um, one of the real characters of early baseball. That's interesting. And I remember uh, I, I took a tour of St. Mary's uh, in Altus and, and they talk that as part of that tour, they talk about his his grave in the cemetery there. Well, the next person, uh, Floyd Jelly Gardner, uh, and you say he's probably the best player born in Russellville. I think he's probably the best player, one of the best players born in Arkansas and certainly in our town. This is a baseball community. I mean, we have we have a tradition of baseball here, you know, lots of lots of youth leagues, uh, even some some older leagues, uh, a lot of softball. It's it's kind of a kind of a community that loves its baseball. But unfortunately, Jelly Gardner was born here, and no one really knows his story. Um, he had the misfortune of of being born at a time when African Americans could not play in Major League Baseball. He was. Um, was born about a mile from my house over here by the elementary school. And uh, when he was about 12 or 13 years old, his family sent him to Little Rock to a boarding school for African-Americans. And he caught on with a semi-pro team and made it to the Negro Leagues in the early 20s. Uh, was a great player, a uh, real character. He had lots of personality. He didn't like to take orders. And um, one time when he was... The manager was a gentleman named Rube Foster, who was very famous in Negro League Baseball. Rube had decided that these guys needed to butt more, so he worked a long time on bunting. And then uh, uh, Jelly got up to bat, and he thought, this is a perfect time to show the guys how, how this butt stuff works. So he, gave, uh, he was standing in the corner of the dugout blowing smoke rings, and Jelly stepped to the plate and hit a triple. And when Je Jelly got to third base, he was, you know, trying to get the crowd whipped into an uproar. And, go, and uh, Rube sent in a sub for him. And uh, apparently smoke rings was a signal to butt. And, and uh, Jelly didn't pay any attention to that. And so the manager felt like uh, he disobeyed orders. And so Jelly got, even after the triple, he pulled him out of the game. And it, Jesse had a mind of his own. I mean, Jelly had a mind of his own. And he's a really funny guy and a, and a quite a player. 94 guys were nominated by the Negro Leagues for induction into the, the Hall of Fame. Uh, Jelly did not make it yet, but there may be a time when uh, Jelly Gardner is actually in the Hall of Fame. Interesting. Well, and then, of course, the Deans. We talked about, Tom and I talked about the Deans earlier, and I think everyone in Arkansas probably has heard of Dizzy and Daffy Dean at some point in their lives. And, and Dizzy and Daffy, the, the Deans are the first family of Arkansas baseball, um, without question. Everyone has heard the names and, and the legends. Um, they uh, pitched uh, in Yale County. Logan, they're born in Logan County, moved and grew up in Yale County, as you as you pointed out. Left early 
in their lives and moved to Oklahoma. And, uh, but, and Dizzy then really became a Mississippi guy. And Paul, the gentleman on the left, uh, always loved Arkansas. His family still lives here to this day, mostly in Greenwood and, and uh, Sebastian County area. But um, Paul Dean was attached to Arkansas. Dizzy never was. But they are the legendary Arkansas family. And when I would go to one of these presentations, many, many people there would say, my grandpa played against Dizzy Dean and played against Paul Dean. And most of the time I just had to nod because to play against them, they had to play against them when they were about eight or nine years old because by baseball playing age, they probably lived in Oklahoma. Now, how did they get their, their nicknames, Dizzy and Daffy? Well, Dizzy supposedly got his nickname because he was – once a manager called him, you, you dizzy guy or something, and just called out. Dizzy loved it. He called himself Dizzy Dean all of his life. Daffy Paul Dean did not like being Daffy at all. And so uh, he really preferred the name Paul. Uh, dizzy preferred to call him Daffy. Uh, sometimes he said, me and Paul will do this and me and Paul will do that. But but Dizzy and, uh, dizzy and Daffy kind of uh, fit the the uh, persona that Diaz was trying to send. Hmm. He liked to use those names. Um, you know, I'm old enough that I can remember uh, Dizzy Dean, uh, not necessarily his playing, but his uh, commentary during games later in his life. Yeah. And I, even as a child, I was amazed at how he could butcher the English language. It was really remarkable. He figured that out, didn't he? He figured out that that was uh, um, kind of a, uh, his uh, claim to fame or his persona. Uh, if the funny thing that happened about that, Tom, was other Arkansans that followed him were expected to be Dizzy Dean. Mm -hmm. So he, even if they were college educated, like Preacher Rowe and some of those guys, they were supposed to have a little Dizzy Dean edge so that they could portray the same Arkansas nonsense that Diz did. And so this kind of left a, a mark, not as a scholar, but as an Arkansan. Uh, and, and people kind of expected all Arkansas baseball players to be Dizzy Day. Now, I've heard, uh, Jim, I've heard that there's an interesting story about Paul Paul's wedding. Am I Paul, correct in that? That's correct. Paul actually got married here in Russellville. Um, his wife was a former Miss Russellville. And uh, in 1934, when the Deans were at the top of their game, they just won the World Series, Paul came back to marry his, I guess his girlfriend, but they, they had not really dated a long time. But obviously, Paul came back in December and asked her to marry him, and she said when, and he said tomorrow or the next day or some long engagement like that. And, and so they set up a wedding for here in Russellville, and... Um, the day of his wedding, Paul decided that he needed some store-bought clothes and a, and a uh, professional shave, and he headed off to Fort Smith to do those things and didn't make it back for the 5 o'clock wedding or 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. Um, it was 8 before Paul got back to town, and the wedding party was still waiting on him over here in Russell on 4th Street. Um, it's what's now the Taco Villa, a really famous restaurant and uh, eating place in Russellville. And... Uh, so when Paul got there, they were still waiting on him. It was would have been the biggest social event in, of the season, but they kept it under wraps. There were only eight people there. But the next day in the paper, the headlines all said, Paul Dean wins Miss Russellville. It was it was quite a day. A Russellville would like to relive that because it would be a big, a big publicity day for the city. Well, she is striking looking. They're both striking looking in this picture. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, Jim, you belong to a group of uh, baseball uh, research enthusiasts, correct? Correct. Um, it's, uh, it's the uh, Robinson Kell uh, chapter of the uh, Society of American Baseball Research, for American Baseball, baseball Research, as you mentioned. Uh, everyone says Society of, Tom, and I do too about half the time, but it's actually Society for um, American Baseball Research. Um, one of my friends said his wife asked this week when he said something about 
me being a baseball historian, his wife asked, well, what qualifies somebody to be a baseball historian? And uh, his answer was, well, first you've got to be old, I guess. And then, then I guess you have to have some interest in things that nobody else cares about. That's what my wife always said. Jim is interested in things that no one else has cared, cares about. So that may be the case. But uh, we quickly point out in our chapter, there's some PhDs, a math professor, an engineer at Garver, uh, and some of those uh, accountants in Little Rock, some of those guys that make us have a little better reputation. But uh, I, I can't talk a lot about what made SABR famous. But, you know, baseball today has a lot of science and math in it. Um, it lends itself to scientific work and it lends itself to statistical analysis. And SABR and some of the really um, intuitive thinkers of SABR have come up with some of these indicators that have actually changed the way baseball players are, are evaluated. And you hear the term sabermetrics, and it's uh, the math formulas and the science formulas that um, are used to evaluate players. You hear things like uh, spin rate and uh, launch angle and uh, a statistic that combines two or three statistical categories into one, and maybe OPS is this one that they're leaning on today. And a lot of those things came from the math science end of SABR. Some real scholars have done some work on that. And those of us in the other part of SABR are the people who are the history tellers, the, the people who like the old stories. And our part of SABR is uh, the chronicling of these old stories and the recording of these old stories and the, uh, the retelling of those stories. Um, after I wrote my book, I, had, I claimed that one of the things I was trying to do was to protect those stories. And um, in hindsight, that's really good. And I'm, I'm proud of that. I wish that had been my first intention, but now I'm proud that we're doing that with, uh, with some of those stories. Now, for those uh, who might not be familiar with uh, uh, baseball players, historic baseball players from Arkansas, can you explain the, the uh, Robinson Kell sure. name in the, in the chapter name? Brooks Robinson on the left in that graphic and that logo it was third baseman for the Baltimore Orioles. And George Kell on the right primarily played for the Detroit Tigers. They were contemporaries in that Kell was leaving the game about the time Robinson was entering the game in the mid-50s. Uh, they actually played on the same team for a, a few months there. Um, they were both men of high character, uh, both uh, hard to find flaws with them. They both loved Arkansas. Uh, George Kell made his home here, served in the Bumpers administration uh, as a highway commissioner, I think. Um, uh, Robinson has a deep love for Arkansas, came back a lot until he had a recent injury and now can't come back as often. But uh, it just seemed like to some of the founders of our organization, um, uh, Madison McIntyre, still the president, Fred Worth, math professor I spoke about, and some of the early leaders um, were, were interested in, in not only having an organization, but having an organization that represented Arkansas the high ideals of Arkansas people and players. And uh, the first meeting I think was in 2004, they'll correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, they chose to name uh, the, the Arkansas chapter after those two Hall of Fame third basemen who actually entered the Hall of Fame on the same day. And uh, sure. so Brooks Robinson and George Kell um, are the, uh, the namesakes of the Arkansas chapter of SABR. Now we have one more slide, and I think you wanted to talk about the Rogers brothers. I talk about the Rogers brothers because it, I think the Rogers brothers story really typifies um, how things have changed in baseball research. Um, I told you that I often hear the uh, grandpa stories when I go to the, the meetings and uh, around Arkansas, and I sometimes just nod because you know I know they're probably not true, and, and so we're a little skeptical of everything. And uh, you guys were doing research back when I wrote that story 50 years ago, that, those days, when you can imagine sitting there and, and here comes the microfilm, you know, across the screen. And when you look for newspaper stuff, you had to look at every issue 
there weren't any newspapers online, there weren't any indexes. And so you were just, uh, you know, going through these things and, and trying to stumble onto something. And um, when I first started five, six years ago, we already had Google. We already had indexed newspapers. We already had newspapers online and we could find each other. And, and suddenly I found this guy who was doing parallel research to me. <laughs> I believe he's on here tonight. His name was Tom Pretty. He lived out in the Carolinas and suddenly we found each other. And uh, what he had done was he Googled his grandfather. And uh, when he Googled his grandfather, he expected to find that his grandfather's story was not real. And when he Googled his grandfather, he found out he was an exceptional baseball player. He was good enough to play in the major leagues, but he had an education. He had a future here in Russellville. And there's Tom. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom's a text just came up. And uh, so Tom sh and I shared this story and we shared it back and forth. I wrote about it a couple of times. Didn't put it in my book because I was concentrating more on major league players, but when I finish the next one in 25 years, the Rogers brothers are going to have a good spot in that book. But um, Tom and I discovered we were doing parallel research, got to know each other, and we've never met, probably never going to meet. But uh, his his uh, his uh, grandfather, his lower right, Brown Rogers, Mayor of Russellville, his uh, great uncle, if, if I don't get this exactly right, Tom, family-wise, correct me, been a Rogers, upper left, ended up endowing a, a building at Washita with through his son. And Henry Rogers in the middle played for a minor league team called the Newport Pearl Diggers hmm. because it, the button industry up there, right. uh, you know, then they, they sang the river for buttons or for, for uh, clams and made buttons. So they called their minor league team the Pearl Diggers. And Henry came back to Russellville and became the first football coach here. So um, it, it's interesting now when you do research that you, you run on to other people who have the same interest as you. And sometimes they're engineers and accountants and math professors. And, uh, and not just a bunch of old guys who, who just kind of get lost in the cobwebs back in the microfilm. So it's really opened up baseball history. And, and uh, it's, it's uh, really filled a lot of hours for me in my retirement. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, a love of my uh, retirement years. I meant to ask you before we got off of the organization, if any of our uh, viewers tonight would like to join uh, the society, how, how the, the, the Arkansas chapter Robinson Kell, how, how does one do that? It's difficult, Tom. You, how you join is show up. <laughs> so it, we, have, we, have, we have a really uh, uh, intense screening process. Show up, introduce yourself, and, and tell us what you know or what you're interested in. Um, we have a web page. Uh, I don't have it here, but it's, you'll Google Robinson Kell, Arkansas, ASABR. You'll find our website. It has uh, all the past meetings. You can go back 17 years and catch up and see the information from the first meetings. Some of the members in that first meeting are still there today, and they look a little different, but they're still there. Some of us joined along the way. And um, it um, uh, we, we meet in usually in January and then again in August. In August, uh, some of the members stay for a ball game at uh, Ray Winder and uh, Fred Worth's reporting. Thank you, Fred. Fred has got the link down here. Fred is that notorious math professor that I talk about. We use his credentials to verify our work. So uh, he posted the, the website, but it's, it's uh, uh, certainly Googleable. And, uh, and Madison McIntyre is also here tonight too. So. I appreciate you, that. Does the, uh, does the group have a publication? Uh, not officially. A lot of us have done private works, Fred and Madison and I. Um, and so, some of the others. You don't, have have a, you don't have a journal, I mean. No, we don't have a journal. But we do have this website that chronicles all of our past meetings with, with links to writings and so forth. And one of our members, Jim Rasco, is the historian for the Arkansas Sports Hall of Fame. So we have some people in high places and uh, it, uh, uh, it uh, uh, on the website, I noticed Madison is pointing out that he's linked a lot of those articles at that website. And anyone who's interested, we would, we would certainly welcome them to come. We met just last week in Bryant, but we'll meet again in August. And next weekend, the weekend of the 28th, 
Is that correct, guys? A week from Saturday is the uh, Hot Springs Baseball Weekend. And we'll have a table down there with material. So people who are interested can go to that Hot Springs Baseball Weekend, and we'll show them everything they need to know about joining SABR and being part of our group. We'd love to have them. Well, we're, we're grateful, and we really appreciate your being with us uh, tonight. Um, how, how does one go about getting your book? Well, you can order it from all the places, you know, that you usually order books from. Um, you can order it from Amazon or, or Walmart.com. But uh, those, those uh, links on the screen, uh, if you want a signed copy, um, I, uh, I, they're $15, including postage. And uh, you can uh, go to that website. It has information. You can email me, and I can tell you those, that information, and uh, I'll be glad to uh, provide you with a, with a copy. Um, I, and the various history societies, uh, this week I was to Russell Kiwanis Club. Um, in October, I'm going to be in Yale County and Ozark, and, and oftentimes I'll show up around places and take books. So if you just kind of look at the usual places, uh, that you can find me there. But uh, if you're interested in the book, go online, and I'll be glad to send you one signed copy. Well, thank you very much for being with us tonight, Jim. This has been very interesting. Thank you. I know I know it would be because I've read enough of your work to know uh, what you do. And well, I also crazy. write for Only in Arkansas. Right. Uh, yeah. places, and Only in Arkansas is a terrific online magazine, and it has a great stories about food and travel and events and one old guy that writes about baseball. So uh, <laughs> I, I would highly recommend you take a look at Only in Arkansas, and it'll also link you back to my other stuff. Only in Arkansas is a uh, digital publication put out by First Security. What's the name of that? First Security Bank. That's correct. First Security Bank. Yes. And it's and edited, incidentally, by, by Stephanie Buckley, who is uh, the, the uh, park superintendent's wife from Penny Jean Mountain. And a great story in herself. You might talk to her sometime. She's one of those true bloom where you're planting your planted stories, Tim, about being an entrepreneur but still living up on Penny Jean Mountain. Great story. Great story. Well, um, thank you, Jim, for being here. I want to mention, uh, in case you haven't seen the chat, the website for uh, the Society for uh, American Baseball Research, https dot slash slash Robinson Kell, one word, dot wordpress, one word, dot com. And uh, again, but Jim, as you said, if they you could just Google Robinson Kell chapter, that should pull up. And then the only in Arkansas um, website, that's only in ARC, A R K dot com. But again, if you Google only in Arkansas, I think that'll be the first thing that comes up. So thank you very much for being here. This was very interesting. Thank you for having me. And uh, before we leave tonight, I uh, just want to remind you, uh, if you have, uh, you can email us. We have two emails uh, on the screen. Both of them come to us. The first one uh, is a little shorter than the second one. And um, so please email us and tell us if you have and give us some suggestions for some guests or topics that you might be interested in hearing and learning about. And I'll also note that these, uh, Presentations are recorded, and after they're edited, a bit, <clears throat> excuse me, a bit, they are put on our YouTube channel, and that YouTube channel is just Third Thursdays with Tom and Tim, and I think we have a couple of them up there right now, but they're, they're, all of them will eventually be up uh, on the YouTube channel, and I think we have a couple of uh, minutes for questions or comments, if anyone has anything. Jim is still on the... Uh, can, you, can you queue up? Fred Worth, let him tell you about what he does. Um, yeah, yeah. Fred, him... He has a very interesting way of paying respect to baseball players. I, I'm glad he's here tonight to explain that. Fred's a math professor at Henderson State, and uh, he respects the game so much that he's on an interesting quest. And I'd like for him to tell about that. Yeah, let me find him. Where is he? There he is. Okay, Fred, you are on. Hey, can you hear me? Barely. Okay, I'm talking a little bit louder. Uh, I visit the graves of Major League Baseball players. Um, to this point, I've been to, I think it's 8,781 of them. 
uh, th- those aren't all major league players. Some are umpires or managers or coaches. But uh, this summer, I drove 17,000 miles to visit 1,157 graves. Wow. Um, in Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, all up in that area. And uh, Jim is always a very willing and uh, supportive listener when I uh, give talks at our at our Sabre meetings. Uh, he and I, I think, are a mutual admiration society. Uh, we are. I really enjoy what he does. I usually end my presentation by saying, and where are they now, Fred? Because <laughs> Fred uh, has so much respect for the game. He, um, It's a real, real quest that Fred's on. And those of us in the game really appreciate what he's doing. It's it's quite a quite a personal undertaking. In the talk that Jim gave this past Saturday, he mentioned I think it was fourteen different players. I've been to the graves of twelve of them. One of them is still alive, and the other one is one that I didn't know about in Evening Shade, Arkansas. So I need to get up there sometime soon. That was a minor leaguer. Well, thank you for speaking with us tonight. Thank you both, uh, and. Um, We're going to leave you. We're going to sign off. Our next show is going to be on September 16th. Of course, it's going to be on the third Thursday. Jim, again, thank you for being here. Uh, Fred, thank you for your insight at the at the end. And uh, y'all take care. Be safe. And we will see you next month. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.